So this is it, baby. So I don't think I say this as much as I used to say this. I think when um, I first started talking, that was one of my favorites to say. Then it kind of went out of vogue for a while. So what do I mean by this is it, baby? I thought today I could do the talk like with the imagination that people that are listening or maybe like first time listeners. It's hard for me to do that. Um, I got into this subject so young that I kind of forget and I have a terrible memory so it just falls out of my nugget. So the assumption by most people in this society is that there is a them and there is an others, other, which is such a bizarre concept to me now. It's so weird to think that people are walking around in this society believing that they are someone in relationship with someone. It's also really sad because I can imagine that that brings about a lot of suffering for people. So for those of you that haven't questioned this idea, or haven't thought about this idea, the question is in non-duality, is who is actually experiencing this? The assumption by humans is that there is a somebody inside here experiencing this and dictating the body's actions. And that forms by something that a lot of people call the ego. I don't tend to call it that. I call it more like an attachment energy. And the ego is constantly narrating the story of your life and what you're doing. So science thinks that we make choices unconsciously six seconds prior to the conscious mind thinking about it. So you might be like, oh, I think I've got to take an apple because it's more healthier than taking a chocolate bar. And you think that that is you consciously making a choice in that moment but it's already happened in the body the the choice has already been made and then your mind has narrated a story which makes sense for this idea of a separate entity with um independent and uh and autonomy so there is always this assumption that there is a person here and that person feels very close to you so it, 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 so it feels like it's like constantly narrating a story of what you're doing talking about other people there's images of you this kind of this umbrella um, of images and ideas of what you want to be and who you want to try to be like it's that person that you're trying to portray and then you have like this kind of less conscious ideas of how you pe want people to to treat you in order to feel good about yourself, like to, to fulfill that image that you have of yourself. That can actually be a negative image. image. You might want people to treat you badly because there might be a negative self-image. And, and it's a belief the whole time that there is that entity and that entity is conscious. But is this true that consciousness and this entity are attached? Mind is like, yes. That entity that's speaking and narrating is conscious. But if you really investigate it, and this can be like really mind-blowing and life-changing when this realization happens, that that entity that's assuming that it's conscious is actually something which is... There is something which is conscious of it. So... In order for your identity to arise, there has to be something that's watching it. So you could think of your identity like a film on a screen. But there has to be an audience member watching it. Otherwise, does it happen? I mean, that's too existential for this level of teaching. <laughs> like I'm trying to go right back to the beginning. I'm not saying it's like a lower level, but... 
Like that goes to the like Zen koan that you can't answer. If a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody there to hear it, does it make a sound? That we're not going to that. We're going we're trying to stick on this idea of this person. So the fact that you can see these images of what you want to be, and there can be a seeing of this voice that's narrating the story of you, like I'm a good boy, got bad girl, to be here, got to be this, got to do that. No, you let a person in a bad person, but it do bit too Oh, I wouldn't mind a bit of a candy now. Yes, yes, chuck mars bar, mars bar, mars bar. So <laughs> that that entity arises, but there is something that's conscious of it. So if it was conscious in itself, it wouldn't really perceive itself because it is perceiving. What we kind of imagine is that, that it's like there is that person and then the consciousness is in amongst that person. It's because of personal awareness. So personal awareness to me, all teachers talk about this with different words just as a warning. So personal awareness to me is the ability to move our sensory perception. So we move our attention into the foot, into the knee, into the thinking, into the nose, into the taste buds. So we have this seeming ability to move the attention. And because that's kind of mixed up with this narration and then the consciousness, it feels like that is one entity. And that is you. But the fact that it can be seen that you feel insecure, or you're liking yourself, or you're telling yourself particular stories, it must mean that there's something prior to you watching you. Otherwise, how would that be known? There must be something perceiving that. It's a little bit like, I mean, this is a really simplistic, maybe not very good analogy. But if you're in the cinema and you're watching the film, like you can't perceive what's here beside you. Maybe you can like tiny bit, but your, your attention is on the screen. Unless you look. So how, it's not really, it's not like that because consciousness isn't limited anywhere, but how is it? that this you that you think is conscious is being watched and what is watching it that's dramatic what is watching that person so a lot of people might be like huh, what does that really matter but it matters quite profoundly because because of this idea of soul, so in Christianity, with this idea of that we're souls inside this body, and that we've got to be good in order to go to heaven, and if we're bad, we'll go to hell. So, so we kind of, even though we don't explicitly talk about it in this society, we kind of have um, this spectrum going on, you know, of good and bad people, you know, what lives up to society, what doesn't. And this idea that there is a soul, an entity that's being judged inside these bodies. So this is where it begins to make quite a profound difference because what if who you are isn't that soul inside the body that's either going to go to heaven or hell? I know that may, a lot of people have come out of the idea of Christianity, but it's in our society unconsciously that we have this soul that's heading for goodness, like we've got to be the saviour, we've got to be the hero, we've got to bring light to other people, we've got to inform people of all their mistakes. Like if you really relax and admit it to yourself, you'll see that you've got a predisposition to this way of thinking. Whereas if you went to more Eastern traditions that have the idea of oneness or no soul or non-duality, they might not have this, these opposites in such extremity. So, so, you know, you hear it a lot, this idea of evil in a society. And really, what is evilness? There are evil actions, but what is evilness? Where, what, what is that and where does it come from? And it kind of gives us this idea of like, like there is this one thing inside the body and that is somebody. Like, so, you know, I was, I was um, listening to, to one of the 
politicians in England the other day and they were talking about this evil person that should never get out of prison. And if you look at statistics of prison, they, they tend to follow particular patterns, is that most people in prison come from poverty, um, have had childhood trauma or abuse, um, and um, also learning difficulties of some sort. There's a huge percentage of dyslexic people in prison. So that implies like the dyslexia, like if they can't get a job, then other means are used. So if this is true, and we have, a society, we have this idea in the general population of society that there are evil people that need to go into prison, like, like there is this badness. But if this is true, that there is a pattern of why people end up in prison, then it kind of implies that there isn't this solid soul that's good or bad that's inside our bodies experiencing. This changes thought pattern. This really changes the experience also this sense of being you so this sense of being you is very much dictated by what your ego thinks you are and often people's egos are negative so it also changes your fundamental sense of who you are right now it's kind of like true meditation in a way because there is a part of you which we could call consciousness, the big consciousness, that is perfectly still, free of any thought, free of any condition, free, free of any suffering because of external circumstance, and is perfectly still, yet experiencing everything right now, right here. So everybody has like the perfect meditation, like that's what you're told to achieve in meditation, but you already have it inherently in part in, in you, but it's just not apparent because there is this belief that you are a soul and that that stillness is part of this still soul. So it's kind of like the stillness gets lost in all the movement of you. So this is what's really beautiful about non-duality because it's not saying you need to do meditation to get to stillness. You need to do that. You need to give me lots of money, although you're very welcome to. There's a donate button somewhere. Um, you, the, there is uh, all these conditions normally on meditation, freedom, waking up, enlightenment, peace of mind. But non-duality doesn't have a condition because it says it's already there. So everybody is Buddha nature. Buddha nature is like your pure, pure essence in some forms of Buddhism. There's many forms of Buddhism with loads of different ways of speaking about it. So that's pretty funky for a white guy. Pretty fly for a white guy. Yes. I don't even know what that means because we don't say that in England. Pretty fly for a white guy. It just doesn't like suit us. We don't really have that kind of pretty fly for a white guy. So when the, the title, like, this is it, baby, is spoken, what it's meaning is your freedom, that stillness that you've always looked for, that peace of mind that you've always looked for, is here. This is it. So your consciousness is inseparable from what is happening. Your freedom is inseparable from what is happening. The ego, the soul, is always working in time. It's always working on the idea of time and thoughts and images of who you are in time, how you relate to others in time. Like try to think of yourself just here in this moment. Like if you imagine yourself as a body, that's still time because it's like you're not looking at your body now. So, I mean, maybe some people are, they're like looking at me and then they've also got a sim simultaneously a camera running. Like, just in case she spontaneously sees me through her third eye. Um, 
but most of you aren't seeing yourself. So you're already your image of your body is something from the past, the past time you looked in the mirror. And then you imagine going, oh, I might be the same. Trust me, I looked in the mirror many times. But all of that's imagery from past or future. And then if you say, I'm a banker, that's an idea that then passes. It's an idea from the past that you've got because you've been to a job with a label, banker, so you've got all this image of yourself. And it's an idea that comes and goes. So it's not here. It's not something that's inherently here. You could say, okay, it's a furniture, but okay, so that's here. That is here, seemingly. But you can break that down in other ways if you really want to. So you're just left with, yeah, I don't really know what's happening, but this is it, baby. Your idea of outside world, the idea of a bigger world. I, it really interested me, I was listening to a talk by Russell Brand. He was like, you know, before 150 years ago or 200 years ago, we didn't have newspapers. Maybe it was longer than that. And we didn't have this idea of public. Can you imagine how much that changes mentality? Like we're so focused on this idea of public. We watch the news and we go so f social media to find out what's happening out there. But imagine if you didn't have this idea of out there. You just have the idea of the like old town hall and maybe London. Or these ideas that you've read in a book. But it's if you go back more in time, it just didn't exist. This idea of public and all these people were invisible to you. It wouldn't have really been a thought. But yet we walk around with this idea of me in relationship with other people and this big public world. I'm in relationship. We've got the news that tells us all these disastrous things that happen all over the planet. I don't know why we decided to do that. <laughs> Let's just, you know, at six o'clock, just work out, every, just hear about everything that's gone wrong. Okay, what a wise society, yes. Let's listen to everything that's gone wrong. And we might have a little joke of something positive at the end. Maybe news is getting a bit better. It was very political, like news of what the, um, the team in which that TV station isn't supporting, the political party which that TV station station isn't supporting like what they've done wrong. I, my um, friend in England, we had this big jubilee where the Queen has been in um, power in England for 70 years, which is most really going to be the longest reigning queen ever, unless we still have queens in like 40 years time when, or 50 years time when we've invented like the end of aging or something. But maybe we won't have queens then by then because we'll all be like, oh, yeah, it's a really bizarre concept. Why are we doing that? <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so we, we have a queen that's uh, been in for 70 years and we have something called a jubilee party in England. Maybe some of you have seen it. And my friend was watching it and the royal family had to sit in a box and watch hours and hours of a parade. So if you just imagine yourself in that situation, like that's quite hard to sit and watch hours and hours of parade. And this friend was saying, and they really enjoyed it. They were happy the whole time. And I was like, yeah, because if they didn't show happiness, then the me media and everyone would be on them saying how bored they looked or how tired they looked. They would just show pictures of those few minutes they didn't look happy. And so that's such an abstract idea. You've got these like royal family that are being watched by us that are trying to portray, portray the image of enjoying something for all these public people that are going to have an opinion of them. This is all our imagination. It's like so complex what we're doing. And it's getting worse because of social media, like the public is getting bigger, you know. The public out there. What a bizarre concept. And then there is a you that's in relationship with that public, believing it's inside this body. So you've imagined this whole big public out there and then you've imagined this you that's in relationship to it. 
it's so complex, the human game. It's amazing that we can do all of this. But it's um, never going to find you freedom in that world. It's so complex. Your mind gets more and more busy and you lose connection more and more with that stillness of who you are. Or that stillness of who you are gets more veiled by this like chaos of you trying to be the perfect person in every situation and to portray it in the internet, which is this idea of public that we have. So what is this essence? This essence goes nowhere and is just here right now. It's experiencing, but it's not a thing. Like even calling it consciousness is a step too far. It's just itself experiencing itself. And it's not limited to these bodies. So we imagine it like in our head, watching out. It is everywhere. So this consciousness that you're imagining is limited in here is all things. And when you really think about it, of course that's the way. Is there anything outside of your consciousness? Like the, most people have this image that I have consciousness up to here and then there is this world out there. But if you pay attention now, you'll notice that my words, my vision, my, the image of me, these earrings, this hair, this wall, this funky pattern behind me is in that one consciousness. And that consciousness is undefinable. Like it's not like consciousness goes up to here and then the outside begins. How would you be conscious of it? How does that work? And this consciousness is right here, still and present. It doesn't belong to anyone. It doesn't need anything. It's not like, oh, if I just have a, a bon mot now, that would uh, really complete me. It doesn't have a sense that you have to be a particular way. You have to have certain things. It's just content as it is. Not as a feeling of contentment like we imagine, just as itself. You could call it love. Or I call it love. You could call it anything you like. You could call it dinosaur or tree. But I call it love. Love. Love, 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 love. So this ego that spent its whole life trying to get somewhere to be something, to be loved ultimately, is always going to be this dance The ego, or this person that you believe yourself to be, was to set up to survive. And then, because it believes it's real, it's set up to survive with seeking to fat find home in survival. So, one of our survival mechanisms is to have strong attachment to family members or to friends of a community. So, attachment to other humans. So that's a survival mechanism, and then the separation, the identification with this ego, with this person, um, then it begins to, to, to go into looking for freedom in relationships. And what a disaster that is, because you'll never find it in relationships. Relationships are imagined. They're all imagination. There's nothing wrong with that. Like that's part of how our social structure works. It doesn't mean you have to get rid of all relationships. But there is no relationships, ultimately. It's all imagined. And your image of the other person is constantly changing. I don't know if you ever try to pin someone down. Are they a narcissist? Are they an empath? Are they this? And I, I, I label people, um, myself, these different things. But you try to... Um, Pin it down, you find it's like slippery, like an octopus, like <laughs> you can't quite grasp it. It's 
slippery. The same with yourself. And then also the, the struggle that you go through, that the person goes through trying to be somebody. And this is confusing because in order for us to survive, we have to have a healthy ego or a healthy character. A strong character, that's ironic. But because that helps us with survival, if you don't have boundaries and if you don't have ambition, then you'll die more than likely. You can't survive. So that's needed for survival. But the identification with that is suffocating, especially because you... You aren't really that. Like the, the healthy, strong ego only comes up in moments when it's needed. It's not really you. And then the belief that this ego is me, that this person is me, is really painful because then if the me Fs up, which is more than likely going to happen because that's the nature of things, then it's, it's in agony. Like, how could I have done this? And the same with the other person, like the real belief that that is who they are. Mm. Okay, well, maybe that's enough for now.